Max, you spoke of Israel's need to be ethnically pure. How does this compare to the same arguments in Germany in the 1930s? Well, they, they're not exclusive to Germany in the 1930s. Um, you know, how does Portland stay so white? I mean. <laughs> It's not an accident. Settler colonialism has a certain logic to it. And the United States managed to consolidate its own ethnic purity in a very, through very un, undemocratic means, namely genocide. Um, Native Americans were concentrated, much in the way that Palestinians will be concentrated. But what we're witnessing in Israel-Palestine is an ongoing system of, of settler colonialism, whereas the US moved into a different quasi-democratic phase after the genocide was consolidated. Um, Michael Mann uh, has a book called The Dark Side of Democracy and the thesis of this book is that he, he looks at how democracy was created in states like New Zealand, Australia, the United States and Germany um, which failed to do so. Um, he weirdly doesn't look at Israel um, and, he's, and his, his thesis is very simple. It's that um, sometimes democ in order to consolidate a Western style liberal democracy in these countries you need to commit mass ethnic cleansing and that all the so many of these democracies have a history of ethnic cleansing and genocide so you know I think of what, what, I, what would I be doing as a reporter you know if the uh, Lakota Sioux were being ethnically cleansed in the 1860s and 70s I would hope that I would be out there it's part of the reason why I like to be in the West Bank in Jerusalem um, to kind of get in the way and show what's happening. So this is a system that the Israelis have learned from us. Um, they've, and you know, what in Germany learned a lot from our eugenicists. Um, you know, they were deeply inspired by the thinking of American eugenicists, including some who were liberals. So this is not something that, I, 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 I'm not against comparisons Nazi Germany or 1930s Germany and Israelis certainly aren't but I'm against essentializing Nazi Germany um, and seeing it as something or essentializing Israel and seeing it as something that is foreign to the United States and that there aren't shared values between the US and Israel um, that are the wrong ones you know it's very dangerous uh, this is another point um, that I, I want to make it's very dangerous for people like Gilad Atzmon, who is one of the leading anti-Semites of the world, to go around before mostly Protestant audiences and tell them that everything was fine in their country until this, you know, special relationship and the Jews came along and ruined everything. Um, this country has still a lot of blood on its hands and a lot to atone for, and it comes and that and that that stems from the same logic as. That, that, that's being applied on the ground in Israel-Palestine. And finally, it's why we're seeing um, these alliances between Christian Zionists who hold extremely bigoted, even racist attitudes, apocalyptic attitudes, and Israel, which is increasingly under the control of religious nationalists who um, embrace the same mentality. It's why we're seeing people even at the grassroots of the Democratic Party who believe in a multicultural society, who believe in you know, these basic inherent um, traits of a healthy democracy like equality, revolt, be, become revolted by Israel and, and be, be repelled by Netanyahu's Israel. It's why we're seeing the polls shift so that there's almost total support in the Republican base for the special relationship and there is no longer a majority of Democrats who support the special relationship. So I think we're witnessing a battle in our own country of two Americas and one of those Americas rejects the special relationship but the other one which comes from a true American tradition of settler colonialism understands it um, in a very visceral way and recognizes Israel as this bastion of their form of peculiar form of civilization on the front lines as Theodore Herzl said, a rampart of civilization against barbarism. I combine two of these.
I'm going to combine two of these. I'll try to be quicker. And how do you foresee change coming from the ground in Israel? And then Max first, thank you. What do you sense are the opinions and viewpoints of college and university students on the Israel-Palestine issues in the U.S.? And are there grass movements going on? So one is Israel and one is here. Well, they're both related. I mean, what we're, the situation is completely paradoxical in that the situation continues to get worse on the ground in Israel-Palestine. And the worse it gets, the more discourse opens here and the more it improves on campus. That, I mean, I'm a product of that. I decided to write this book on the first day of Operation Cast Lead after I you know, looked at the Al Jazeera live stream and saw these cadets, police cadets in the Gaza Strip slaughtered by missiles fired from Israeli F-16s. I just said that, that, that just, it shocked me. Um, it was like, Someone's, uh, I forget who's, someone said, you know, that's your prophetic call. I said, you know, that's a little bit too much, but <laughs> I did feel something break inside me. And many people of my generation and younger than me are going through that process as they simply look at the facts on the ground. So I was just in Ann Arbor. I, was, I flew up at the last second to the University of Michigan to speak at a debate they were holding on a divestment resolution, which should have been you know, pretty easy to pass. Like, who doesn't want to divest from corporations that are involved in massive human rights abuses? Um, especially if you're paying for it, it's like, you know, should, should have been easy to do, but the student government refused to vote on it. Um, it so happened that the vice president of the student government was an APAC intern, and you know, these kids are total careerists. I mean, they're very opportunistic. They're not that interested in putting principle over politics. Um, so they refused to vote, and the students from the Students for Justice in Palestine chapter held a week-long sit-in, you know, the kind of thing I heard about that, you know, in the 60s. And they become, became very sophisticated and hardened uh, during that week-long sit-in. Um, and they became some of the most impressive activists I'd ever seen when they finally forced the student government to vote. I arrived in this room filled with 600 people and hundreds more waiting outside to hear this debate. And I was the guest speaker. I didn't know that there was no applause allowed and that they have to do the spirit hands. So I come up, I walk up and I'm like, make some noise for these brave young people. And so all I got was wags of the finger. But I mean, you look at what was happening 10 years ago in Michigan. First of all, the auditorium wouldn't have been packed. Like this is the central issue on campus. And it is the first time since 9-11 that the military industrial complex on American campuses is not getting a reprieve. And it's the students organized around Palestine who are challenging militarism and everyone else is following their lead. So at the University of Michigan, that Students for Justice in Palestine was in a coalition with 36 other groups. Pretty much every group representing people of color, brown people, black people, um, Jewish Voice for Peace, you name it. It was a massive coalition demonstrating like this newfound sense of solidarity around Palestine and unity and then in the corner of the room you had the pro-Israel students who are almost exclusively white, almost exclusively affluent, almost ex and, and are there to defend their privilege by declaring that this resolution was divisive. Which, <laughs> it's like you don't want to play along so you call it divisive. It almost reflects what we see in an apartheid state where a small minority is kind of holding a veto power over everyone else achieving their rights. Um, of course, the resolution went down in flames, but it was a very successful tactic. The live stream was viewed by 22,000 people, um, which is just enormous. I think that's more people than watch CNN in a day, <laughs> um, unless you're in an airport. So what I'm seeing... What I'm seeing on campus is nothing short of extraordinary. Um, some of the veteran activists told me that in 10 years ago, this auditorium, the supporters of this would have been exclusively Arab. Now it's like only half Arab and it's, you know, not even majority Muslim. There are you know, white Jewish kids, the Black Student Union supported it. It just keeps growing and what I've seen around this country is, is, is something I've never seen in my short life. It's so extraordinary and so inspiring. And you have to assume that at some point, this movement will begin to inch into the mainstream and begin to be able to change the situation on the ground. I, I don't see a tipping point right now, but what I can tell you is that many of you have been in this much longer than me, and you've made it possible for those young people to do what they did. 
by remaining steadfast, and you've made it possible for me to make this book viable. So everything that you've done is definitely not in vain, even as bad as the facts on the ground seem. Here's a fun one. Do you think Israel will ever let you back in? <laughs> that is a question I get everywhere. And it says a lot about Israel and its imperatives. That, um, I mean, we know that the state of Israel deports over 100 Arab Americans, primarily because of who they are, for fear that they'll settle there, they'll produce more demographic threats. You know, Arab babies are the number one threat to Israel at this point. But they're also deporting Jewish Americans, like my friend Jared Malson, who was reporting for Ma'an News and spent eight days in a cell after he tried to re-enter when he went on vacation with his girlfriend. They deported the dangerous, violent octogenarian Noam Chomsky <laughs> at the Allen B. Crossing um, because he was going to speak at Birzeit University. And I have been treated very well. I mean, I've committed some thought crimes in the past year, <laughs> demonstrated some heretical behavior. I'm number nine on the Simon Wiesenthal Center's list of anti-Israel, anti-Semites. Tied with Alice Walker, right behind, right behind European sports venues. Um, and you know, I, I always say, you know, as a Jewish American, I'm very ambitious and I want to do my best. And so next year, I hope to be number one. Got, got stiff competition. You know, Ayatollah Khomeini was number one this year. So, so you know, it's laughable. Louis Gomer the congressman from Nacogdoches, Texas, an evangelical Christian, not the brightest tool in the toolbox, but a tool nonetheless. <laughs> Call, he called me a Jewish anti-Semite on the floor of the house in a two-hour rant. Um, and you know, I laugh at it and I, I kind of like it, you know, it's just, it's funny to see that I'm getting to them, that we're getting to them, but it, th th these, this, this could have consequences. It could have consequences professionally, it's no joke for Arab and Muslim students to be called anti-Semites and have their photos put up uh, online when they try to pursue jobs after college. And it's no joke for me if I want to get in and reunite with my friends who are all living under Israeli control. So I've been treated very well at the border. I've been treated well at the airport. I'm asked if I'm Jewish a hundred times and I just, you know, check all the boxes. Once I said I had an imaginary girlfriend in Tel Aviv and, you know, the idea of Jewish babies came to the mind of the... <laughs> security personnel and they waved me through an additional checkpoint and so I have my Jewish privilege to count on um, and it'll be interesting I want to close my book tour in Jerusalem and I you know I hope I make it there if I don't you know someday I'll come back and those security personnel won't be there anymore instead you know all of us will be welcome to Palestine I'm not sure if uh, these were related questions or not, but they have kind of the same penmanship. Uh, how do you see the end game being played out? And the second one is uh, speaking, can you speak to what's called the terminal project of Zionism? I don't see uh, how the end game will play out. There are scenarios that are, that are indeed apocalyptic, and there are scenarios like the South African scenario, which offer a cause for hope. I think an even better model is Northern Ireland because you still have kind of two peoples with deep antipathy who are managing to kind of live together in peace in a single country or confederation. Um, and we have to look at models beyond the failed two-state solution. I mean, I can look at things in the near term and talk about that. And John Kerry's framework agreement has completely failed and Mahmoud Abbas is you know, demonstrating like some, like scintilla of backbone. He still doesn't have a backbone. He's not allowed to have a backbone. But, you know, with joining 15 international organizations, if he would join the International Criminal Court, there will be a move in Congress to defund the PA, and the, U the U.S. will use that money to bribe the PA um, into submission. And if you look at the situation in the West Bank, it's a complete 
complete house of cards created by the US and the EU, where you have one out of four households completely dependent on a PA salary, which is like one out of four people, and these are people who are the heads of households. So you take away that salary. Um, I was there actually um, a, a year ago, and the salaries had gone down, had been halved. And everyone is in debt because they've been put in this neoliberal model where they've been told to get cheap houses, to move into Rawabi or whatever, and put everything on credit, to buy cars on credit, to get cell phones on credit. The, the, the communal nature of Palestinian society that enabled the first intifada has been shattered. So you take away the salaries and what happens? You have complete chaos. And of course the PA can't last forever, it needs to go. That could lead anywhere. Um, but ultimately, is, I do see Israel eventually re returning to its role as the direct occupier. I see the two-state solution completely collapsing, and there was a poll recently commissioned, a GFK poll by Shibli Telhami from the Brookings Institute. Telhami is, I think, the only Arab American I can think of who has actually served on a negotiating team for the U.S. And he asked Americans, a you know, thousand Americans, uh, and, you know, across across political lines, what, what do you favor if the two-state solution collapses? A Jewish state or a single state with equal rights for all? And 64% of Americans declared that they favored a, sing, a single state with equal rights for all. Only 24% supported a Jewish state in that scenario. So that's what's coming down the road for Israel. And in the meantime, we've got BDS on steroids. I mean, it's just gonna spread so rapidly. Yeah. And so finally, I mean, the question is, where, will there be a reconciliation process that will allow Jewish Israelis to be kind of normalized in the region under a regime of equal rights? Um, that's the question. Will, or will they resist it? Um, and I can't really speak to that. I can tell you that um, if you look at Eugene Terreblanche, and what he did, this far-right figure, the kind of Meyer Kahana of South Africa, um, he attempted to bring back the apartheid regime after apartheid collapsed. And he carried out many terror attacks before it collapsed in the final days. And there will be something similar, a, uh, a sort of terror blanche style movement um, as the you know, day, date of reckoning grows closer. And we see the activities of the pro-Israel lobby grow more and more fervent and vicious. Um, the smears are getting more personal um, and that will continue. And so it's really going to require um, those of us who are you know, heavily invested in seeing a regime of equal rights hanging in there um, and being able to withstand, um, I think, the, the, this, this, this huge wave, this massive resistance that we'll witness from the pro-Israel lobby. Um, yeah. Where do you believe the Israel, Israeli society will go politically? Will they continue to drift more rightward? Or will Israelis decide that the occupation isn't worth it? That's a great question. I mean, there is no possibility for change from within um, as long as the status quo is preserved from without. So the more that, I, th I think that the boycott and what we're seeing in Europe with the EU actually and, and, and European banks um, refusing to fund settlements, refusing to um, allow settlement goods on shelves in Europe, this is actually opening democratic space inside Israel. Um, but in the, in the meantime, the right wing will continue to dominate and you look at the figures who are in the Likud party, the governing Likud party. There's Netanyahu who positioned himself in the 80s as more radical than his mentor, Yitzhak Shamir, who is the leader of the Stern Gang. And now Netanyahu occupies Israel's hollow center. I mean, Netanyahu in 1989 at Bar Ilan University actually called for massive expulsions while the world was focused on Tiananmen Square. So he's no moderate, and now he's in the center. And to his right, you have people like Sipi Hotavelli, who I mentioned, who hosted members of the anti-miscegenation movement in the Knesset to testify on the dangers of assimilation. You have Zev Elkin, who has um, authored legislation um, allowing civil penalties on any Israeli citizen who calls for a boycott of se settlement goods, who favors annexing the West Bank. Um, you have Naftali Bennett, um, who I mentioned before, the economics minister who favors a single Jewish state 
in other words, a unitary apartheid state from the river to the sea, um, and who endorsed the anti-miscegenation movement when it banned Jewish women from volunteering in hospitals. So these are figures who have all one thing in common. They were raised in the post-Oslo era. They're all in their 30s and 40s, and they have no patience for the peace process or for the idea of a Palestinian state. There's Danny Danon is just is one of them as well, um, and he's challenging Netanyahu for leadership of the Likud party. So Netanyahu probably could be in power till 2017. So what's the alternative? The labor is moribund and will not hold more than 18 seats. Um, then there's the Meretz party. You know they're kind of they're stronger than they were before, but they're still not capable of getting more than 10 seats. You're looking at like 80 to 90 seats in the Knesset of right wingers. Um, and you're looking at Netanyahu's successor being either the figures I described or Avigdor Lieberman, the foreign minister, who was just presented in Haaretz, the voice of the liberal Israeli public, as Israel's only hope for peace. A man who called for drowning Palestinian prisoners in the Dead Sea and bombing the Aswan Dam in Egypt. A man who favors transferring hundreds of thousands of Palestinians in the um, Arab Triangle in the north into the Palestinian Authority. So this, these are the options as long as the status quo continues. And as I mentioned before, Americans look at this, especially liberal Americans, and they're revolted. And that's why this movement is growing. The, the final question, and if you can do it in like a minute and a half or less, is where do you see hope? I'm looking at it. Thank you.